Good evening. Welcome to Relove Guitars again. It's another evening. Uh, what day is it today? It's Tuesday. And here we have Simon's uh, vintage brand 335. Now I don't know what the correct name for this guitar is, but being vintage brand, uh, but it's a kind of a 335 style. And it's a pretty one. You've got beautiful inlays, as you can see. Um, you've got faded gold hardware. It's currently got um, flat wound strings on it and we've got the sort of normal configuration that you'd expect with the switch over here, which is miles away, except that's the only abnormal bit. Now, we did a little adjustment on this switch because it was apparently keeping coming undone. So we put a little, little gouge on it to allow it to be held in place where we turned it. You can't reach it from there and you may be able to reach it from in there but the idea of tightening it up every or having to take your strings and your pickup out every time you tighten up the thing seemed a bit crazy so we went for a, uh, a little hack um, so with this guitar it's it's quite an old one it's a pre wilkinson i would think um well yeah it is it's one of the older ones but having said that there's absolutely nothing about it that isn't pretty good I mean, it's a weird headstock, you know, this is a, a playing it safe design that they evidently had back in that point in time. I don't know what year this would be, but, you know, a couple of little blemishes here and there, and it's a bit dirty, and oh, we tightened that up already. Um, yeah, so basically, uh, you know, early, early vintage brand where it was made don't know it's got a solid center block in it um and you know it's pretty nice um but it's got a plastic nut on it and uh we could do with cleaning it up it's i think it took a little bit of did it have some marks somewhere no but it was certainly sharp um so simon was not happy at all with the sharp edges down here so some of the yeah, oh, yeah that one there some of these frets are really sharp so we're going to take care of those i don't know if you can see this one here where are we looking at mm -hmm, things like that yeah th th this is the one yeah this has taken a bit of a, a wounding somewhere see all those little marks and it's also got this horrible sharp bit. So we'll tidy all of that up. And the fret levelling will help us to get rid of some of that. But we'll put a nice new tusk adjustable on. Um, which will work well with the three-a-side headstock. Um, yeah, it's got some replacement, uh, what do you call it, these things. They don't look like they're the gold ones. Although it could be because the chrome has worn off. Um, yeah, so while, when I sort of do this I'm going to out of interest take this pickup out and have a look and see if you can actually reach there if it's only accessible through here then there's practically no way on earth you can reach into there and hold that still in order to tighten it which would suggest a, a pretty um, awful design or not great design I wouldn't say awful but so the first thing zings I'm going to do is I'm going to get straight in you can't see this bit I'm going to take the uh, that plate thing off, scratch plate, and I'm going to just have it out of the way so that I can clean in and around it, which is a, gives me a chance to, it makes the polishing part of things easier. So we've got two the same sized, yes, yes, talk to me, meow, meow. what's it saying, anything interesting? Google Payments, check your AdSense, well, sounds glamorous but usually it just means um, Google's giving me a small amount of video revenue you know ad revenue so before I go any further let me just quickly check the relief on here there is a nice little bit of relief I'm not going to adjust that just now let's take the truss rod cover off anyway just in case you, you never know it's always good to have it out of the way ready um, the reason I'm putting a, what do you call it, a roller bridge on this, even though it's going to look a little bit newer, although it's not a bad, it's quite a nice, subtle 
gold chrome. It's not uh, massively blingified. But the reason we're going for that isn't particularly style. It's because Simon is, is doesn't like the the way that the tunematic bridge digs into his hands, into his hand when he's palm muting. So figure that out. Now the only thing I don't like so much about leaving these original strings um, is that I have to have them on during the fret uh, leveling process which isn't the worst thing in the world but um, with all strings I don't like to be moving them off and on too many times um, because it obviously strains and stresses them and we're much more likely to get a break but if we're careful I think we can work around these now the issue with vintage, um, let's see if you can have a see. The thing with vintage, certainly more recent ones, um, is that the joint here between nut and shelf in the more modern ones, uh, I think for ease of construction, is done in such a way that the, uh, the finish gets sprayed after the nut's put in. So it rides about a millimeter up the front of the nut. You can imagine it rising up to this height here. So the nut is basically glued in by the finish. Um, and then if you come to tap it off to replace it, which is what I want to do, you run into a great big problem because you can very easily split off and damage the, the finish here. Now, I am going to, from what I just saw there, I will wager that that isn't the case here. It looks like the, the slot, the shelf, has been cut and the nut placed on top of it. So we will find out very quickly that if this doesn't want to move and threatens to break things, then we know that's a problem. But it isn't. There's a lot of glue on there, so it has taken a little bit of the, the shelf with it. So what I'm going to need to do is get a blade and carefully just um, scrape off some of the excess glue here, keeping the strings out of the way, because obviously I don't want to cut those or mash those up. So this little gap here um, is not going to be a major problem. I think there's quite a bit of course, quite a bit of sticky glue on the face of that. Um, my I think I may leave with leave live with that little gap rather than try and fill it or grind down to bottom it out. I think I'll just place this on top of it. Um, it shouldn't be a problem. It's only a small little uh, pothole, if you like, in the overall surface. So what I, I'm going to do is I'm going to use my favorite tr trusk, trusk adjustable nut game. So first of all, let me just, while I'm here, let me just prepare off to the side the uh, feet on this nut, which I want to be, I want to get them um, flat so that they don't basically don't um, they spread the load of the strings. I've also got a little, a little molding tag here which you often get. Get rid of that. Okay, so just to flatten off this, these feet, and a bit of grinding, pretty much down to just about where I want them, and then switch over to a finer gauge sandpaper, and this will basically smooth them out nice and flat. Okay, that gives me a, a nice footing and it's flush. So I'm now going to place it in my base that I'm going to use, which may be, if it's a little tight, I will try another one. No. Nope. that feel? There you go. Very snug. So the idea will be that will sit upon the end there. It's about the right height to begin with, so I'm kind of happy with that, even the way it stands. 
don't think I need to do much to it. Um, what I don't really know is how even this uh, shelf is. And I would know there's a little, a little tear away, um, which makes it a little bit of a, like I say, a pothole. But generally speaking, I think it's all fairly smooth. But I'm just going to give it a quick go over like that, so in case there's any tags or glue sticking up. So what we'll end up doing is gluing it on there like that. So although there's minim minimal work to do, I do like to just move this for a second. I do like to get a fresh bit of or a cleanish bit of sandpaper up and I'm just going to sand flush the front edge of the this this. So I want it to run. This isn't the best. It's got a bit of glue and stuff on it so but I, I still want to get the, the nut face as flush as possible so I sand it flush on the second roughest paper and then I just give it a, a going over with this is 240 so I want it absolutely smooth in this direction um, and then I put it on there I can feel it sits pretty well on there. Um, there is a, I think there's a little bit of proud on the, there is, it is a little bit proud on the edge of the fingerboard there, but I'm not really entirely sure what I can do about that, if anything. So that's me done tweaking the nut. Sometimes you get lucky and they fit beautifully well. In this case, that's one of them. So just say so running this down here there's definitely build up of crud glue crud there so I'm gonna chop that off I, I don't want to cut too far into the, the nut because it's you could you could do but that feels a bit better yeah that's that's a snugger fit okay so I know that I'm gonna fit that nut and what I'm gonna do now while I've got the strings backed off I'm going to mark up the frets ready there is some fret wear down here um, but we're going to take that away and at the same time as trying to get what is this 12 13 14 15 16th fret is the the one with the some fairly serious dings on it probably something's banged off the guitar face of the face of the fretboard sometimes it gets dropped face down and the strings it hits something that pushes the strings into the fret and sometimes if it bounces a little bit you get several impacts all in one go so much as I don't really like to use these strings for fret leveling I, I will do my best to keep them very clear of any trouble uh, it should be all right so what I can do with now with my new tusk nut on is the first thing I do is I'll tighten up the G and the D or the D and the G and in tightening up those I can sort of hold the um, nut in place so a little bit of pressure on there it'll even out when I get all the strings tightened and before anything else I look at the D and the G and they're now both um, they're both sitting on the first fret and that's where I want the strings to sit at this point so I'm going to do a complete full circle well actually I'm going to go around until I'm going to push around until we've got some purchase then I'll do a full circle and that lifts it up quite a bit. I'll come around here, I'll dial this in until it touches and then do a full circle here which lifts it up as well. So I'll now tighten up the others, even out the pressure. So we're okay at this end, we're a little bit low at the base end, so I will raise that up a little bit more. Now we'll get a thing, <laughs> tuning fork.
Okay, so that's the nut set. It's pretty low first fret action, but that's fine. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to keep this bridge on it for a minute. And I'm going to... Actually, I probably should have taken the bridge off, but it's too late. <laughs> I'm going to lower the action to where I want it. Now, I will obviously change it when we get the new bridge on, but that's not a problem. Uh, what am I looking for? That one. So I'm going to go for my standard target action of 1.5 or a little bit above. This is a kind of jazzy guitar. It's not a... This thing's stiff, old and stiff. Let's give it a little bit of support as we go in. Okay, we're just over 1.5. That's good there. Let's see what we're on this side. We're 1.75 on that side. So we're going to take this one down as well. That's about 1.2. It's pretty low, but this should withstand it. Go. there's a high fret that's cool we'll take care of that now so we've got our preferred nut we're going to get our fret leveling but bar, bar beam bar beam bar beam bar and we're going to get stuck in so here we go i am now i have to confess i'm miles behind in finishing videos i've been so busy that i've been doing the guitars and not making exporting the videos so not a great thing but it's just the way it is um, been had a very busy few weeks that feels to me like about right so what I'm going to do is I'll start with this one and I kind of expect straight away to discover um, a high fret up there now for all I know it could have been number 16 uh, it could have been banged in the middle and bent up at the end. So let's see if number 16 shows up as the problem in this thing. So a light leveling to begin with um, it will be the thing that shows me right away what's what. And yep, sure enough, uh, yeah, number 16 is standing up high at the end. So whatever damage it's had, um, it's taken a whack. Now I'm just going to I'm just going to stop for a minute because what I don't know about 16 is whether has it come out so far that it actually needs tapping back in, um, which could be a, a bit of a problem. Um, it doesn't look that far, so do I tap it, which risks breaking the kind of seal, or it's it's not really guaranteed to make anything stick down. I might get a block and do a very careful, careful single tap. What have we got here? We've got a 14-inch radius. Uh, Let's go for something else. Here we are. A slightly bigger one. I'm going. Yeah, I'm going to tap the edge while I'm away from oh, keeping the strings as safe as possible. Right. That's all I'm going to do to it. No more, no less. Um, and now I'll carry on. Just as I thought, because it's it's obviously had a hit on the body uh, on the length of the fret, so it may be that it's given it a strange. Uh, strange um, springing up at the end but either which way if it's firm and it's staying where it is then we can use the fret leveling process to take it down so it's showing that everything after here is low pretty much there's a little except well there's just about touching here it's mostly low high one there um, cutting cutting low cutting a low spot here so there's high well up down, up, down, up, down, down. So it's quite a lot of, quite a lot of um, unevenness in this neck. And, and that's not at all surprising for me because it's what you kind of expect to find with any neck because it's made of wood and it behaves a certain way under longitudinal compression and you know with the loading of the strings on it. So they bend they bend the neck a little bit but they also compress it while they're bending it so i've um 
giving everything a bit of a level now on this first e-track there's still a low one right at the end there um, now we'll replace the high e and then I'll test play just to make sure all of these notes are playing okay taking care of that double note you see so that's all good so we'll carry on in the same vein use the same calibration for the B track and then we'll do a new calibration for the G track now I'm kind of expecting some of the characteristics of the high low to carry on as we move across into the B track um, but some things for example like this dented uh, 16th fret kind of maybe expecting it to level out away from where it's been damaged so hopefully we won't show up to so much of a problem I've got most of the um, damage out there there's still just a tiny little dent but it's very very small it might actually be just enough or little enough now for the sanding process to um, take care of pretty good. I'll give it a, the fraction more because for the sake of that tiny little bit of um, fret metal we can remove the sideways clicking which which is what will be worst about this damaged fret. So let's see if we can't just iron that out far enough to for it not to be a, a problem anymore. I think that's just about it. Right on the top of that fret you can't feel it. Right. Good. So now I'm going to calibrate for the G track. Um, what, I do, what I'll do after I've leveled and recrammed these frets, I'm going to go and wash my hands and get some hot water for cleaning up my hands because they get very dusty when leveling and I like to have some hot water standing by like a, a doctor in an old western fetching hot water and blankets when the and the, um, the women go into labour as they inevitably do in these cowboy films. Okay. So I'm going to again keep an eye on what's happening over here. Actually, that's all right. I'm not going to worry too much about that. Let's get the dust off. Just been um, prior to this, I was doing some sanding on um, Daniel's Hona headless. Which I'm stripping down to bare wood and doing a... Um, like a true oil finish on it um, but I found as is always the bloody way I found as I got down stripped it all off and underneath the color of course you're going to come across bad luck and the bad luck is they filled in a couple of imperfections so when you plan to do a, a natural finish you're going to have to oil over these grotty looking imperfections thankfully it's on the bottom edge by the the, that thing that you put your jack socket into um, but you know nothing you can know because that's the beauty of doing a painted finish of course is you can cover up repairs and, and blemishes and of course that means from a manufacturer's point of view you can use up uh, a lot of timber that would otherwise not be usable so you know painted solid color guitars are you know a, a much much loved by the manufacturers because of that reason. Um, let's just check this. I'm pretty confident it'll be fine. Yeah, so I'll show you. We've got a kind of, I mean, generally speaking, the wood's multi part and it's got a three piece neck for strength and so on uh, through neck. but 
what we've got, apart from everything, the front looks okay. We've got that, which is some really, some plastic wood filler. Um, and there's not really a lot I can do to get rid of it, sadly. Uh, so we're just gonna have to live with it. If we stain the body a little bit, it may help to blend it in, but who knows, but there's no way around it. Anyway, so once I've got all of the, the last bit of um, primer off that, which is the hardest bit of all, getting rid of the primer, because it's really thick and it sort of, it's there as a filler as well as a primer. Once we got rid of that down to the plain wood, um, I've then got to do a little bit of reshaping. I've also got to try and route, uh, create a, create a square rectangular cavity and r slightly route out the uh, neck pickup which is going to be difficult actually considering why considering oh god because i don't have any reach around the neck but i have to raise it anyway so i'm going to route a route out the neck pocket and then we're going to make a rectangular block as precisely as is humanly possible with bare hands to fill that back in and it's never going to look perfect but uh, he doesn't want the neck pickup in there so that's that's going um, but in removing the neck pickup we also sort of have a chance of strengthening the neck joint now we say neck joint but in a way you go ha ah, but it's a neck through it doesn't have a neck joint well yes and no it it doesn't it doesn't have a neck joint except one it effectively does because the neck pickup route goes almost all the way bar for bar about 10 mils through the uh, through body neck through block which means if you've chopped it off just before the neck pickup you're effectively gluing a thing into the into the it's not a through body it's a very short neck with a, Okay, with a thin bit and then the rest of the bulk. Um, so it's not, it's not, I don't really consider it a neck through from the position of, oh, well, it's very strong, you know, and runs all the way through. It's, it's not really that. Anyway, but to make it stronger, um, the good thing is putting a block in the place where the neck pickup is, is effectively like repairing the weakening that's being done to the neck through. So I, it gives me, gives me more chance to reduce the neck heel which is something that's been annoying him for the longest while so we'll strengthen the through neck by filling the cavity with a glue piece of wood and of course the, the way I have to do it is I have to figure out how to make the strongest piece of insert I can do and for it to be uh, to, to work with the shape that's currently there. It's a very organic, slightly crude neck pocket, neck pickup route. But uh, beautiful. Um, yeah, so it's, it's pretty organic and like a bit hand carved. So trying to um, trying to cut something to fit that would be nigh on impossible. So I think the best way to do it is to go for a slightly wide, wider precise rectangle, which I can make a template for, route that, and then make a block with the same geometric precision, if possible, make a block um, to fit that. The problem with routing, trying to route a reciprocal of a shape that you routed, um, as I don't have any means to do that. You could say, well, you could calculate inwards from the thickness of the router bit and then go exactly a quarter of an inch in and give yourself, um, cut yourself a shape which becomes the guide for your, your block. But uh, I don't think that's going to work. So my aim, my plan, would be to simplify it by turning the, that pocket from its thing with ears, as it currently has, turning it into something with... Um, uh, just a rectangle, a, a very sharp rectangle, obviously with 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 um, rounded corners, because the the that thing can't go round the corners, can't make sharp corners. 
Well, we could chisel sharp corners if we wanted to try and get a fit. Um, so that's, the, that's always the problem. The router will give you, if you try and route the thing out, it'll give you a, a uh, give you a curve, a sort of defined curve. But if you try and um, if you try and take a square cut block and carve that those corners to match, you won't get them anywhere near the same. So again, we've got a problem. We either chisel along the straight line and then try and insert a a rectangular block, which you know the chances of getting that absolutely precise at the corners is nigh on impossible. I'm not really sure. The alternative, we have another way of doing it, with a bit of a cheaty way to do it. We do it in stages. So for example, we we fill the um, fill most of the cavity um, with a block and resin so that we, we don't have to worry quite so much about the fit. Um, and then we concentrate on making a fit work as we get closer to it. And we stop below the surface of the wood and then we just find ourselves cutting a smaller piece of wood to make a tighter fit. And that we have much more control over the corners. It doesn't have to fit all the way down. There's a great three-dimensional volume. So I think that might be my my plan is to do it in two stages and to be fair underneath it can be as inverted commas messy as as it likes as long as it does the job which is to um, create a solid or a, a stronger joint and fill it in and then we'll go for a go for a, um, a visual fill uh, above that I think that will be that will be my strategy so here we have the, we get the fret crowning file and we go on medium. These aren't massively jumbo frets, so we use the medium part of this. So how can you how can you I mean how can you see this? Yes you can see it. So I'm going to uh, crown these frets now all the way up here. And then after that, it'll be a case of uh, working the fret ends while the strings are all off and the strings are over there safely out of the way. And we'll do the fret ends, the filing of the fret ends. And then um, after that, we'll concentrate on continuing to sand them when I do the rest of the frets. So we hopefully soften those fret ends up as we go through. So some of these uh, were quite high and have a quite a pronounced flat spot on them for the time being, so they'll take a little bit longer when we get to them. And of course, we know that number 16 is one of those. It will take a bit of extra hard work. The idea here is I'm just using this file to round off any flattened spots on the frets so that we return the shape of the fret in cross section to a an arch shape or a concave profile or section sorry not profile concave cross section concave is it convex cross section um, basically the kind of way that the fret began life um, but if we take some height off it obviously we flatten it and that makes a flat spot on top so we want to reshape it within the remaining material um, because it's ideally to perform the best at its best it needs to be that arch shape so the crowning file does that by rounding off the edges of the flat spots as seen looking from side to side here and it brings the round the edges inwards until we stop when there's just the thinnest of black lines of marker pen still going across the top. And that will tell us that we've rounded off the square edges or the flattened part of the fret, but we haven't reduced its height overall, which is, of course, what we want to do since we've just spent the previous part of the process getting them level. Now, they're not, we haven't got them level like this. We've got them level when they're under load. 
and that's a big difference. It's not a, it's not a, a trillion ton of difference, but it is a difference. And it's one of the reasons, and there are several, but it's one of the reasons why I continue, like to and continue using this fret leveling method, because it's the only method um, of leveling the frets with the string loading at play on the frets, uh, on the neck, sorry. And that string loading causes the neck to not only bend a little bit, which has some relief, as we know, puts some relief into it, but it also compresses the neck, which makes some groups or clusters of frets stand higher than others. So it bunches them a little bit. Now, if you are leveling frets with the neck off like this and the strings off, sorry, the neck relaxed and the strings off, then you do the leveling. And in this condition, you might get them all relatively level relative to each other. But then you put the uh, guitar under string load and you compress it long ways um, and reintroduce that compression and the curvature and stuff. And it's the cur it's a compression more than anything. Whoops, wrong one. Compression more than anything that makes the biggest difference. So that's why I've uh, became a convert to leveling the frets with the compression at play, because it uh, it basically recreates what the neck does when you're playing, as opposed to uh, working doing the leveling on an arbitrarily flat neck, since your neck is never going to be flat the minute you put it under load and dial some relief in. Um, and the, the method that I use here, as you could see, when, when I was going through showing the, the file reveals the ups and downs, the clusters of high and low frets relative to each other. And that's the kind of bumpy topography of the neck caused by the loading of the strings. Um, and you wouldn't see, you might see that. Um, it's accentuated by the uh, loading of the strings. The neck may already have it. It may be, it may be sort of inherent to the, the grain and the structure of the neck. Um, but what you can certainly say is once you put it under load and the neck has done all it's going to do in terms of bends, in terms of compression, when the loading's on it, then, then you know what the actual shape of your neck is in play. And of course, the only time you, the only way you want it level, want the frets level, is when it's in play. There's no point having arbitrarily level frets um, for this for a condition or, or for when your your strings are off. Oh, I've got I've got a, a beautifully level set of unstrung frets. Well, that's, that's good to nobody if the minute you put 180 pounds or whatever it is of string loading onto them, that the they bunch up in a slightly different way and the neck behaves in a different way, and you suddenly have clusters, little spots of high and low. So as you, you can see what I'm getting at, that the, the important thing here is to have them uh, leveled under load or under loaded conditions. Now I'm going to take the uh, tuners off this guitar. Um, because it's such a nice old thing and it's black and it's grubby, I like to give them all a clean before I go too far or uh, along the way. Um, and in order to clean this headstock front and back I do need to get these tuners off because if you don't then you can only work around the peg the posts and that's highly unsatisfactory because it never truly works out so taking a, a few minutes to take the tuners off I find is a really good way of ensuring that um, you get it right Get it nice and clean. So flip it again. Get our little uh, thingy. This one, whatever it's called, you know that screwdriver. Find a small bit. Small bit. Thank you. And we'll remove these. Now I'm taking these off, and I'm going to put them. In the, in the, put them down in the sequence that I'm facing. So when I turn it over and I go to pick them up, they're in the corresponding sequence. And I keep them separate from the ferrules so that the ferrules are also in the corresponding sequence when I have the guitar facing in the direction that I 
need it to be when I'm about to put the ferrules in, if you see what I'm getting at. Sort of makes sense to me. Also, um, taking the tunes off allows me to make sure, you know, see them visually, make sure there's nothing wrong with them. Um, and I'm also able to spot any uh, breaks or splits in the headstock, which is not uncommon um, because of the... You know, sometimes when somebody puts... Uh, puts um, I don't want to use that one, that's mucky. I need to open my new bag of cloths any minute now. I think I've got one left to use. Um, yeah, so when people sometimes change tuners, they can replace the tuners um, and maybe use slightly too large screws, in which case you can, on some headstocks, um, not this one because of the way it's built and this type of tuners, but on some headstocks you can get owners splitting the, uh, splitting the headstock whilst upgrading the tuners. So I'm kind of on the lookout for that. Gives me a chance to see it uncluttered. I'm going to do here, I'm going to just give everything a quick once over with the naphtha. This will get rid of the bulk of fingerprints and surface grime, um, which makes in a, it will make a final polish a lot easier. Um, so I kind of go over here. Now the thing is, um, it will get mucky again when I sand, uh, sand out the frets, but uh, it'll be most of the way towards um, being clean and like I say just it would only require a little bit of uh, that thing polishing wiping to get it clean there's such a load of <laughs> fingerprints on it and then I, because I've taken the scratch plate off I can get underneath it get a quick a good sort of run at cleaning underneath there and get rid of all the sort of fingerprints and as many of the permanent watermarks that build up. And these ground in grime, ground in dirt. Let's take these out as well, might as well. Oh! Remember, while I was here, I wanted to see if I could look, access the uh, three-way switch in a, a more civilized fashion. So let's take a look at that. I think I'm going to need to open up my next packet of cleaning rags because I've got to do a, a little bit of scratch remover polish on here on some of these bits of dried-on grime. Um, but I might I'll save that for a little bit later once I've done the polishing off. But Meantime, it's got most of the beginning grime off, and you can see it's actually quite it's quite mucky. Now, let's have a, a, a sort of look at this. Let's remove this by hand for a minute and see if we get access to that under there. If not, I will have to declare it an absolutely nightmarish design. Um, at least with the less pull you can get to the switch from the back. Um, but with this thing, you've only got the F-hole and there's no tool I've ever seen that I could hold to use, I could use to hold that strongly enough while I tightened it up to, to stand any chance of it staying put. Um, so, you never know. Okay. Wow. Righty ho Here we have the construction. It's a bit... It's a bit old-fashioned in there. So there's a, a little, what do they call it? That tenon. So the the, uh, the neck joint is very shallow. It's to there with a tiny bit of neck tenon thrown in. But if we turn this carefully around, we get to see we can get into the cavity over there. Uh, courtesy of that hole um, which is cool we sort of suspected that which is fine um, it would have been insane not to have done it but even having 
built it that way. Uh, the idea of blimey, getting to there and f sort of holding that still a nightmare. It's not much further than that, but it's at least, well, you can't get in there with that. But this one, holding that tightly enough to lock that in place is is uh, mm, not my idea of good fun. So very good luck to all ye who try and uh, try and tighten that up. <laughs> so I'm just trying to wipe off some of this grime before I put back on or put the pickup back in its cavity. The thing with the black guitar these black guitars is that they they dirty up so fast it's nigh on impossible to keep them clean. So oh good. Well, despite it being easier, I wouldn't be able to use that access in any meaningful way, really, I don't think. Because to be quite straight, I don't think I could, um, I don't think I could hold that with one finger. That's what you, that's really all you've got to do. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is, uh, as you've probably seen millions of times before, I'm going to get, start with my throw that on the floor. I start with me masking tape. I'm going to mask off this whole neck. Oh, no, 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 no. Before I do that, I'm going to do the fret ends. Now, the question with these fret ends is, are they rounded off? They are rounded off. What they aren't is they're sharp in these little corners. And this one, particularly because it got stood up, it got pushed upwards in the, in the air, wherever it's gone there. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to I'm going to get the little file like this, and I'm going to hand sand hand sand hand file each one of these little corners, which in a way sort of spoils part of the precision crafted look of the fret sometimes. But it's the only way to get rid of this little stabby point that um, will get get you in your fingers. So I think it's got to be done. And I always say that it's function over aesthetics, really. Or function over form, I should probably say. To keep the quote vaguely relevant to the original. So I'm just going down all of them. Uh, and I'll do both sides, even, even if it's not that many that are sharp. But... And treat them all the same. I'll turn the guitar around to do it because it's probably probably easier. Or uh, is it? turn it. I, I sort of prefer to come at it from that angle. <laughs> yes, I do. So the aim in a minute will, when I sand these frets out, I will I try to sand and soften up the uh, f any file marks now, because the file is still quite rough, even though it's effective at sort of cutting off the sharp points. Um, it is in and of itself a rough, relatively rough file. 
compared to sandpaper. So I'll be aiming to round this off and soften it off as I go through. Okay, that's that bit done. So now I will replace this and I'll go off camera for a minute, sort out me, me nice hand washing water so I can keep my hands clean when it comes down to putting strings back on and doing the final tweaks. But what I'll do is I'll mask off the whole neck with tape and then I've got a whole series of sandpaper grades ready to go which I will use to polish out all of these frets, including the ends. And then we'll, when that's done, um, we'll clean it up one more time and then re-string. Uh, oh, also we'll need to, to glue in the nut, which is we know is fitted and works. Um, so we'll re-string um, and just double check everything's good including reset the height because we've obviously taken the, taken the bridge right off and the st we're going to put the, um, the new bridge on um, one of the other reasons that I recommend those bridges over the original tunematics is for some reason um, I keep finding that the tunematics seem to have seem to almost always have the G, G, G saddle uh, too high compared to the rest You'd kind of imagine that the G and the D would rise up to the same point, but they don't. They seem to have them so that the G is the highest of the entire sequence. There's no real logic for that, so I don't like it. It annoys me. And so when you replace it with a roller saddle, you tend, a roller bridge, you tend to find that the saddles are much more even. Uh, boring, boring, boring. Okay, well, I'm going to stop this and uh, I shall see you when I've polished all this out, cleaned it up, and we're just doing the strings back up. See you in a bit. Okay, so we've got it all together again, polished out, and everything on, tuners back on and stuff, and now I'm going to connect up, connect up, string the strings, but of course they're all coily. Um, which doesn't make things easy. I've also oiled the fretboard, fingerboard, whatever you wish to call it. Oh, actually, I'm going to put that off to one side. I'm going to extract the A as well, if I can. Get it off to one side. God, it's terrible when you've got all these strings tied up with each other. It's not what we want to be doing. Second, second-hand strings, really. Uh, that one's tied around there. Uh, come on, go under there. Right, let's try and get the this one on first, the D. Um, mm -hmm. Come on. So this is, I'm putting the D on first, so I recommend, whenever I use tusk adjustables, I recommend doing the, uh, the two middle ones on first and on, off last when you're taking the strings off to change them. So on first, off last. Oh man, come on, which way around is this? Now putting the G on, and then we'll do anything after that. Doesn't really matter which way around it is. Oh. Uh, please come along.
Okay, so this straight away, I know this is a wound G on this set. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring this G forward, G saddle forward to where it's going to want to be for the wound G, which is like there. That's a good preparation. And let's have a look what we've got here. put it on the uh, roller saddles before you tighten it up. I have to stress it to get it on there afterwards. Okay, so everything done, uh, polished out the baked on grime, um, cleaned everything up. I used some scratch remover polish as well. Um, got it as clean as I can, so the worst now is I could just give it a, a, br a brush down, a quick wipe down with a cloth, and it will be nice and clean um, before Simon comes to get it. <laughs> it always picks up dust. Black guitars always do. So it's pretty much all ready. Just going to need to set the height of the action now and um, uh, check the intonation. Okay, everything's on. So first of all, the action now down here is too low. So I'm going to raise this up. Tighten it a little bit. Now I'm going to just again focus on the action down here. So it's a tiny bit over 1.5, so we can drop down a little bit. And then on this side, it's just about right. Okay, so we can get a bit of a stretch just to bed things back in. Even when you um, take old strings off and put them back in, you store up some slack back in the string train. So you've, you've got to give it a little stretch. Obviously not quite as much. Not quite as much as when they're new. Nice. I'm just going to quickly check the intonation and then we'll be pretty much done for this one and get off home. I've got a bit more, a bit more nitro cellulose spraying to do, a tiny bit, and then home. It's a little bit difficult to do this on this type of guitar because it wants to it wants to kind of crunch the squish the thing down. So I need to replace these 
batteries too. Okay, so it's a bit flat, that means the string's a bit too long. So I'm going to bring the E forward. about there and I'll bring the B forward a little bit too. On most guitars the distance between the E and the B is never more than a millimetre. adjustment here but we are pretty much there that's a bit flat so we'll bring that one forward and then the E tiny bit forward too there we go intonated Doink. she's done what a lovely beast freshly polished I hope you can see the improvement in the glitter uh, new bridge old bridge in the bag cleaned up new tusk adjustable nut all ready to go. Twitch owner. See you on Friday, Simon.